Well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, in my last lecture, we took a look at a, a catastrophic century, a century that was dominated by economic crisis and demographic collapse, 60% of the population killed. And I described how out of this turmoil came a distinctive architectural style that is often described uh, in the books as being the perpendicular style. But in doing so, I spent quite a lot of time concentrating on what I would call polite architecture, on castles and churches and on palaces. And so I want to start this evening um, about by writing that balance a little bit, because we haven't heard for a little while about where the more ordinary people lived. Now, the Black Death had uh, a huge impact on the countryside. And when this was coupled with the agricultural depression that I described in my last lecture, uh, the consequences were very serious. Between uh, about 1370 and 1520, as many as 2,000 villages were abandoned and many, many more of them shrank in size, leading to the abandonment of perhaps 500,000 buildings across England. This is a picture of Warham Percy, famous uh, deserted village in the care of English heritage, um, uh, a place deeply atmospheric, and uh, as you walk through it, you get a feeling of these, this uh, place that has just been abandoned back to nature. You can see the roofless church um, in the background. Yet this really drastic depopulation of the countryside was rather surprisingly actually to the benefit of the people who lived there. Because, of course, because there were fewer people, basic foodstuffs were cheaper and more meat and fish was available for everyone. And as a, resu as a result, people's diet uh, markedly improved. Wages were also higher. Unemployment was lower. The choice of jobs was wider. And women took on many skilled jobs like weaving. But the real change was the opportunity that was presented by the changing position of the landowners. Now, um, Quite a long time ago, three lectures ago, I described how between 1184 and 1215, the landlords of England had moved to take their own lands into direct management. They farmed their lands themselves. But between 1380 and about 1410, that whole process was reversed. Landlords realised that agriculture was unpredictable. It brought low profits. And that in contrast, if they were to rent out their lands, it would bring them a guaranteed income. So this change from direct management by the landlords to renting out their lands had a profound effect from about 1400, bringing a new and powerful group of farmers to prominence. Now, technically speaking, a farmer, to use a technical sense of the word, is someone who pays a fixed rent or a farm for their land. And this new group of tenants acquired perhaps as much as a quarter of all the agricultural land in England. Some of these people were former employees of the Lords, and many of them were just richer peasants. But what this represented was a fundamental redistribution of wealth array, away from the aristocracy and the, uh, the church landowners to a new class of people who created new social relationships and new methods of production. And across large parts of England, these men built themselves houses. Hundreds of timber-framed farmhouses from the period about... 1430 to about 1530 survive today. Particularly you see them in the richer parts of the country where um, obviously the better quality ones were built in Kent and Sussex as far west as Hampshire and north into Essex and southern, southern East Anglia. Um, this is <coughs> a generic diagram that shows <coughs> broadly speaking what they were like. Now these buildings shared, broadly speaking, a similar plan. Um, what they had was um, a central open hall 
with two blocks of accommodation um, at either side of it. Uh, the whole thing was contained under a single roof, and in some parts, um, as in this one, uh, the upper floors here were jetted out over um, the lower ones, and in the grander houses, there would even be a sort of little screens passage here with these doors leading to the, um, the kitchen and uh, the buttery. Here is uh, one that's quite often illustrated. It's a really beautiful house, a place that really makes you want to get out your checkbook and sell out and leave London and go and live in it. Waterhill, um, Watermill House in Benenden in Kent. Uh, this is very much as the late 15th century uh, man who built it um, actually left it. And in the Midlands and Western England, very similar types of buildings are to be found, although, uh, generally speaking, of a slightly humbler nature. Now, what's really important about these buildings is that they were completely detached from their farm buildings in such a way that there was nothing that you could tell by just looking at that house that it was occupied by a farmer. There's nothing inherent in the design of that building that says a farmer lived here. These families had their own halls, just like their social and economic superiors. They had separate bedrooms, they had separate parlour, they had a separate kitchen. Beams were carved, doors were panelled, their windows were filled with glass. Decorative metalwork, drains and uh, guard robes were all now sort of standard fixtures. And the owners of these buildings were active consumers of a wide range of household goods. And anyone who's been in the medieval galleries of the Museum of London will see the sort of things I'm talking about. Decorative ceramics were ubiquitous, furnishing textiles, furniture. Um, so these uh, houses were very sophisticated and they were filled with consumer, consumer goods, if you like. And so, in this period, to the countryside was added a new type of housing, below that of the gentry, but above that of the peasant house. Houses well-built and well-tuned to the lives and the aspirations of a new consumer class. Now, this same process that created the farmers and their farmhouses had a big impact on the houses and the lives of the landowners themselves. The most important development for them, and I mentioned this last time, um, started from around 1300, was a noticeable decrease in the mobility of these households. Because, of course, early medieval households were always on the move. But during the 14th century, the households moved about less and less, and some of them, in fact, just stayed put in their houses for the whole of the year. Now, there isn't any single cause for this, and as you can imagine, historians argue over why this happened. But there is one factor that I would bring out as particularly important. Because so much of their land was now tenanted out to these farmers, it meant, out that lords, it meant that lords weren't now living off their own estates as they travelled around, and at the same time, they weren't forced to go and visit their far-flung land holdings at opposite ends of the country. So they stayed put much more, and these longer periods in one place affected both the design and the economy of the houses in which they lived. So, for instance, if you are living in a house for much longer, you needed more storage space for your household goods. You needed uh, bigger wine cellars. You needed uh, bigger wardrobes for your textiles. Your permanent staff, who then lived there permanently rather than moving around with you, needed to be accommodated in ranges of lodgings. And these people had to be fed the whole year round. And so these great houses started to become huge local consumers, consumers of firewood, of candles, of foodstuffs. And this stimulated local markets and local market towns in a way that these great houses simply hadn't done before. So, as I described in my last lecture, these great houses became bigger. They became more complex, more richly appointed, and most lords chose to develop one or at most two houses rather than having lots and lots of houses dotting around the country. Now, uh, 
during the period immediately after the Black Death, most landlords saw their income reduce. Um, and this period of decline really lasted for about 100 years, until the 1470s. But from the 1470s up until at least the 1520s, most landlords saw an increase in revenue from uh, their uh, rented lands, and what this meant was there was an upswing in aristocratic building, a big upswing. So what were they building? <coughs> well, uh, as I've said a number of times in these lectures, towers, um, either freestanding towers or as gatehouses, had been very much at the heart of aristocratic buildings in England from Saxon times. This is uh, the early Norman uh, castle at Castle Rising in Norfolk, just around the corner from where um, I live. Very typical, um, which isn't typical, it's rather grand, but the, the concept is typical of the sort of thing that was being built in the early Middle Ages. They uh, were expensive to build. They conferred status uh, on the place as well as on the person who owned it. They were very nice places to live in. They had great views. But during the 14th century, a small group of aristocrats started building a new sort of tower, which was in effect a complete residence all squeezed into a single tower, containing a hall, chapel, lodgings and domestic offices. Perhaps the best of these, um, and you see a very fine English heritage flag flying above it, um, is at Walkworth Castle in Northumberland, which dates from 1377. You can see this compact tower here was a complete residence, all in one. Uh, the Duke of Northumberland didn't need to leave his residence at any point um, because everything was there. Old Wardour Castle in Wiltshire, now ruined, another English heritage site, very fine, started in 1393. But these were precursors to the huge integrated tower that was built by Henry V and designed by the King's Mason Stephen Lott at Sheen. Now Sheen is modern Richmond upon Thames and this building you see in this painting here was begun in 1414. It was almost certainly this really spectacular new royal residence, a huge tower on the banks of the river, which was nearing completion in the 1430s, that completely re-energised the construction of great towers in a whole group of aristocratic mansions. And the men who built these very spectacular towers were very close to the royal family. Uh, Rafe, Lord Cromwell, the treasurer of England, built this spectacular tower at Tattershall in Lincolnshire in 1434 to 1446. It belongs to uh, the National Trust, you can visit it. Uh, the most powerful man in Wales, William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, uh, built this place, Raglan Castle in Gwent from 1461. <coughs> what you can see here, here is the uh, the, the majority of the castle, but here is this spectacular tower in its own uh, moated enclosure with a drawbridge that led into it. This is very much like the palace at Sheen. Henry V's palace um, had a, a, a moat uh, round the, the, the great tower which allowed him really to, to occupy his great tower in isolation from everybody else. And then uh, there was William, uh, Lord Hastings, who was Edward IV's Chamberlain. He constructed a great tower at Ashby de la Zouche, um, also now ruined, that's in Leicestershire, in 1474 to 83. I could go on. There were lots of these very big buildings built in this period. Of course, all blown up during the Civil War, which is why they're all um, ruins now. But what these great aristocrats, these inner courtiers, were building was imitated by the gentry and lesser men. And so, uh, if you go to um, Minster Lovell, you can see what Lord Lovell built. This is in Oxfordshire. Here is his house um, next door to the parish church, also with um, a substantial um, tower at its heart. But by the end of the 15th century, these um, towers were becoming less independent, self-contained structures 
and more integrated with the principal rooms of the houses. And two buildings are very, very important in this process. The first of these um, is at a building that no longer um, exists. This is Edward IV's new lodgings at Nottingham Castle. This is a plan of Nottingham Castle as it was. When you go to Nottingham Castle today, you see uh, a building built in the 17th century. And so when uh, all the Americans come over very excited about seeing where Robin Hood lived, they can't because it's gone. But this is where um, uh, the Sheriff of Nottingham was. Um, here is the, the, the keep yard, the upper ward. Um, but this is what Edward IV built, this great tower here. But it was integrated with a range of lodgings um, on the inner um, curtain wall. And this range of lodgings is one of the most important buildings built in the 15th century. This is a reconstruction drawing of what it looked like. So there's the big tower integrated with this range um, of lodgings. Because uh, these lodgings which faced inwards into the castle had this series of seven two-storey bay windows. Um, the king's private lodgings were um, in the tower itself, but um, his uh, outer rooms and magnificent chambers, which he used for the reception uh, of visitors, was, uh, were in these uh, rooms in the bay windows. This was a radically new building. It's a very important building. Here you see, for the first time, the use of the bay window as a distinctive feature a feature that was to go on and more or less define Tudor architecture for a century or more. So the first of these two very important buildings that integrate the tower and the lodgings is Nottingham Castle. The second is Greenwich Palace, also now disappeared. But what you see here is Antonis van den Vingarder's view of the palace from the river. Here's the River Thames. This is where the Royal Observatory is now. This is where, more or less where the Queen's House is and the Maritime Museum. This uh, is in the courtyard of the buildings, uh, the, the, the Royal um, Hospital, um, which stands there today. Um, here in about 1500, Henry VII's master mason, Robert Virtue, took this integration to the next stage. This is not a building that was fortified in any way. It presented this great long range to the River Thames with bay windows looking out both ways. You can see the bay windows here. Um, big bay windows all the way along this. And in the middle, as part of the main range, a tower rose containing the king's lodgings. Funnily enough, you can see it better on this view from the top of the hill, the 17th century view. Here's the long river range. Here is the big tower sitting in the middle of the lodgings. And Greenwich was to become the blueprint for houses of status and pretension for the following 20 or 30 years. Now, in, uh, in the autumn, when I come back to speak about the great houses of the Tudor period, um, it is back to Greenwich which I will refer. This was a seminal building in the history of English domestic architecture. But what you're seeing, uh, certainly what you saw in this plan anyway, uh, is just one range of a palace that actually was uh, comprised of two courtyards. You can get a feeling of the two courtyards in this picture here because there's actually a courtyard in there and a courtyard in here. For houses of this sort of scale, a single courtyard wasn't going to be enough. Now, as uh, I described last time, many castles had been based on a single courtyard. But uh, larger castles had, uh, had two courtyards, or two wards, or two baileys, an outer one for the household, for the retainers, for services, and an inner one for the lord's family. But uh, from the 14th century, this large courtyard was um, adapted um, as, uh, as a magnificent uh, approach to the second or even the third courtyard um, in, a, in a great house. Here is Dartington Hall, and you see the great hall, which was the culmination of the house. To get to it, you went through two courtyards. This is Wingfield Manor in Derbyshire. Um, a really important house. The remains of it survive. It was built between 1440 and 1456. And here you see um, the arrangement, uh, the outer court, 
surrounded by lodgings, very magnificent, there's a great barn here, uh, a gateway, and when you go through the gateway on the other side, the, the really important buildings, the great hall, um, the, the lodgings uh, of the owner of the house, um, and beyond that, um, gardens. The Duke of Buckingham at Thornbury Castle, this is now a hotel, if you're feeling very rich, you'll want to go and stay there. Um, this is the outer court here, and you can just catch a bit of the buildings. There's a gatehouse there. Gatehouse to the inner court, now cut down. Former great hall across here. Uh, the lodgings of the Duke of Buckingham here, his private garden there. Um, this is a house of one, two, three courtyards. And then, of course, if you go and visit Hampton Court today, uh, the guts of which were built by Cardinal Wolsey, you can see there another triple courtyard house. So, uh, these big houses um, were all part of the changing lifestyle of the aristocracy, the ballooning of the size of these buildings because uh, residence was more continuous. But of course, one of the effects of uh, the increasingly sedentary life of the aristocracy was that as they uh, travelled, they didn't have the ability to stay in their own houses. And so they had to uh, rely much more on renting accommodation for the night. Now, of course, from early times, people had rented out space in their houses for travellers. But from the 13th century, it became increasingly uh, common for towns uh, of almost any size to provide um, inns. Now, we just have to get a bit of um, nomenclature here sorted out. Inns were like hotels in the Middle Ages. Taverns, which provided good quality food and drink, including wine, were more like restaurants. And alehouses were pubs providing basic food and uh, quite down market rooms for the night. And from the 16th century, these distinctions between inns, taverns and alehouses were recognised in law, defining the various licensing restrictions and the obligations of the different types of landlords. So we know from a census that was taken in 1577 exactly how many of these sorts of buildings were in England. So there were, and I'll just read this out, there were 17,367 alehouses, 1,991 inns and 401 taverns in England. So that's how we know. There's quite a lot of them. Now, <coughs> these alehouses were very often just people's ordinary houses. The um, larger houses, which had cellars, were generally more successful as alehouses. And this is because before the 1450s, when the more alcoholic beer, um, which was fermented with hops, uh, was sold, most people only sold ale, which contained only malt, yeast and water, and didn't last very long. And so if you had a cellar, you could keep your ale longer and you could have a more successful business. So the larger houses with cellars were the more successful um, uh, ale houses. Taverns were also essentially houses, although they were um, larger and almost always had cellars because they sold wine, which is the sort of distinguishing feature of them. And therefore, it was only really inns which had a distinctive architectural expression. So inns um, in the 15th, uh, late 14th into the 15th century were basically commercial ventures. They were constructed by landowners, very often actually constructed by monasteries, with the uh, objective, quite simply, for making money. Here is the powerfully atmospheric George Inn at Norton St. Philip in Somerset. I've stayed there. It's very nice indeed. Uh, big open fire and you stay in an amazing um, uh, 14th century uh, bedroom in a bed which has probably been there since the 14th century. certainly felt like it. <laughs> <coughs> it was built by the Carthusian Priory of Hinton in order to provide accommodation for merchants who are visiting uh, the market and more generally to stimulate trade. It's typical of a type of inn that has this sort of fine uh, stone facade to the street 
And behind that, there is a hall um, and kitchen, and there's a sort of single range that runs around the back where um, the rooms are. A narrow archway, which you see there, led to the rear, where perhaps um, there were stables. Here is a slightly later, it's about 1480, but even more pretentious inn. This is the George Inn in Glastonbury. This is uh, in the ownership of English heritage, but other people um, use it. Um, very fashionable stone facade bearing the arms of the abbot uh, of Glastonbury who, who built it and the arms of Edward IV. But what is undoubtedly the most spectacular surviving example of these inns is the new inn in Gloucester. This is a slightly different type, and these were very, very common, but very few of them survive um, in uh, their entirety. It was built by Gloucester Abbey in uh, about 1450, three stories high, timber framed, built around a central courtyard, which you can see here in a little drawing. On the street front, this is more or less what you see today. There are shops, and these shops here, I mean, obviously, in the 15th century, it wasn't the flight centre, but it was something else. Um, uh, there, were, there were shops here which were deliberately built to rent out, and then there was a, an archway there which led you into the central courtyard, around which uh, there were rooms ranged in upper floor galleries. Um, the new inn had over 20 rooms. They were big rooms. 20 foot by 12 to 15 foot, and they would have contained several beds for up to half a dozen occupants. And so I think you can probably calculate that a, a big inn like the new inn could probably accommodate about 200 people when it was full. There was a hall and a kitchen, and then there were a series of private um, parlours for private dining. And so somewhere like the new inn could accommodate the travelling household of an aristocrat with some ease. The most important guests would dine in their own rooms, which would be furnished with chairs and tables and benches. The less well-off dined in the hall and then shared their beds with travellers and a variety, probably quite a big variety, of bed bugs. So a bed um, in a cheap inn would cost you a penny a night, less than the cost of dinner. The swankier establishments like the George uh, or um, the uh, inn at Glastonbury would, of course, cost quite a lot more. So we've been talking uh, for the last few minutes about the lives and the houses uh, of the aristocracy. But I want to uh, move uh, on now to talk just for a few minutes about the church. Now, in my last lecture, I explained that church building in the 15th century was not driven by the aristocracy and it was not driven by churchmen. I showed you churches like this one. I showed you this slide at Saffron Walden, a church which was the product of merchants and squires. I also explained that most parish church building was about extension and adaptation rather than complete rebuilding. There was, however, a big exception to these points, which I now need to address. Because between about 1415 and 1530, English kings once again became the greatest patrons of church architecture anywhere in Europe. Henry V planned three monasteries next to his palace at Sheen, the one I showed you a few moments ago, and he completed the large charter house there. Henry VI founded chapels at Eton and King's College. I'll come on to talk about those. Uh, Edward IV started a chapel at Windsor and also a friary at Greenwich, and I showed you Greenwich Palace a minute ago. And Henry VII commissioned the Lady Chapel at Westminster Abbey and a friary um, at Sheen um, as well. And most of these works, the ones I've just described, were only completed in the reign of Henry VIII. Well, all these royal monasteries, of course, don't exist anymore, but at Windsor, at Westminster and at Cambridge, three of the most remarkable buildings of the entire Middle Ages remain. And they represent between them the stylistic changes that began towards the end of the 15th century. A process of increased richness or what they called at the time, busyness of ornament and decoration. Now, for those of you who've 
followed my lectures, uh, this should be no surprise. For every single style of architecture that I have described to you in this lecture theatre over the last uh, couple of years started plain and simple and ended up over-elaborated and over-decorated. And this is, in fact, a basic characteristic of English architecture. And we see it in very clear terms in these great royal commissions that were started in around 1500. So let's have a look at these buildings. <coughs> In 1471, Edward IV commissioned the great new chapel of St. George at Windsor Castle. Here's Windsor Castle. We talked about the great royal lodgings uh, uh, last time. This is what I'm talking about now. This is the lower ward. This is where uh, the, the monarchy is living. This is where um, the new chapel was uh, uh, um, commissioned by Edward IV in 1471. It was designed to be an even more splendid setting for the services of the Order of the Garter, in which the King took a special interest. But of course, it was also really about the glorification of the Yorkist dynasty and was intended to, to uh, form a mausoleum for um, himself and his heirs. The architect was a man called Henry Jannings, who had worked at Eton College uh, for Henry VI, and I'll mention Eton College later. And many um, of the elements of the remarkable interior of this building will be familiar from the two uh, crucial buildings that I described in my last lecture, which are the um, choir of um, Gloucester Abbey, Gloucester Cathedral now, and the nave of Canterbury Cathedral. But the combination um, that was created at Windsor created a totally different effect. Look at the extreme verticality and the narrowness of what was achieved in both of these buildings. Uh, what happens at Windsor is a completely different effect. It's not at all vertical. In fact, it seems wider than it is tall. It isn't, but it seems like that. And this is because of the extensive use of these arches that we call four-centred arches. Um, arches with ha which have arcs of a very, very low pitch. And this makes the ceiling of St George's Chapel, Windsor, much more like a cove than a vault. And it's these arches, these four-centred arches, which become the defining feature um, of English architecture from around 1400. They're almost ubiquitous from 1500. Um, they create these very wide openings, letting in huge amounts of light. Now, St George's um, was finished in the reigns of Henry VII and Henry VIII. But by the time it was nearing completion, another royal commission, conceived in a spirit of rivalry with Windsor, had already started. This was Henry VII's uh, commission of a new lady chapel for Westminster Abbey. And this was to have a triple purpose. As a shrine to his pious uncle, Henry VI, as a chantry for um, himself uh, and his family, and of course a, la a lady chapel for um, the Abbey. This was the most ostentatious addition to Westminster Abbey since the reign of Henry III and was a triumphal statement of a nouveau riche king. He was determined that it should be more lavish in every way than the chapel of his predecessors at Windsor. So, inside, rather than the blank arcading between the arcade and the clerestory, as at St George's, is a band of niches containing uh, um, uh, amazingly expressive um, sculpture. So, in most buildings of this period, um, above the arcade and below the clerestory, you have a sort of blank series of panels. Here you can see uh, this band is reserved for the most over-the-top um, carving. So here's the contrast. You see the sort of the, the blank arcading that you see uh, uh, in Windsor and at uh, Westminster, this riot of decoration um, and incredibly lifelike statues. Of course, in the middle of this chapel was to be Henry VII's tomb and chantry behind a gilt bronze screen 
containing the monument that you see here to the king and queen. There was to be an altar uh, and a reredost with gold-covered figures topped with a hundred nine-foot-long burning tapers to burn in perpetuity. And above all this was to ride the fantastical fan vault with these stalactite-like pendants falling from the conical fans. And the weight of this vault is taken by external piers fashioned as octagonal turrets crowned by OG domes. But of course they're not recognisable as piers from the outside because they say, share the same grid of tracery as a series of tall bay windows squeezed in between them creating this continuous cage of tracery round the outside of the chapel. So this is all held up by these great big lumps of masonry here which are restraining the flying buttresses there but you don't read these um, as buttresses because of the windows between them and the decoration above tie it all into this great uh, incredible homogenous um, whole. So the third of these buildings was King's College, Cambridge. Um, this had been begun by Henry VI in 1448, but in 1499 it was still less than half completed. The finishing touches were actually only put in in the 1540s under the patronage of Henry VIII. But this chapel, I think, combines more brilliantly than any other building the principles of design that were begun at Gloucester in the 1340s and 50s. The vaults, the windows and the panelling are perfectly integrated into a single cage of tracery. But it isn't the detail, I think, that you see here. It all combines to create a single monumental space. The walls, I think, seem to be almost entirely of glass. You can't see how that great roof is held up. It seems completely to confound gravity. But from the outside, you can see how this illusion was achieved as the elevation is broken up by this rhythm of great buttresses that holds up this incredibly heavy stone roof with a wall that is you know, completely glass, basically. But even these buttresses, just as at uh, Westminster Abbey, are concealed by this series of low-level chapels, so that when you're outside, you don't get the um, effect of the buttresses um, because their full depth um, is hidden at ground level. So three extraordinary buildings. And uh, no uh, other... Uh, ecclesiastical institution, whether it be a parish church, a cathedral or a monastery, could really compete with this sort of patronage. But we shouldn't forget that even into the 1510s and 1520s, the monasteries were still amongst some of the most important patrons of architecture in England. The monasteries, of course, didn't escape the economic crisis which I described um, earlier on this evening that had affected all landlords after the Black Death. During the first half of the 15th century, the value of their land and their rents fell exactly the same as everybody else. And, in fact, as a consequence, many monasteries fell into debt, some of the smaller ones merged or some even closed. But almost all communities shrank in size. And as a result, um, although there were a few uh, monasteries that had significant programs of building during the 15th century, this was not the great age of the monastery. Some um, abbey churches were modified, some were reordered. But uh, the, uh, the big theme is a gradual dilution of community life in favour of individual privacy and comfort. Now, this trend was given um, unfortunate and unintended impetus by the Cistercian Pope, Pope Benedict XII, because what he did was authorise half the brothers at any one time to eat meat away from the communal refectory. And what this did was permanently undermine the sense of community and it encouraged independence and individualism amongst the communities. 
1421, Henry V accused the senior Benedictines in England of a life of complacency, luxury and worldliness. And to a degree he was right. The rules which were once so strictly observed had been weakened and bent and although only a very few monasteries were generally, you know, and genuinely vice-ridden, many were complacent and worldly. Monks now had personal property. They had guest houses, they had holiday homes, and most abbot's houses were rebuilt, giving them privacy and luxury. Possibly the most magnificent and certainly the best surviving uh, of these um, abbot's houses is the lodging range built by Prior Singer at Wenlock Priory in Shropshire. <coughs> this was built in the 1480s and still is a private residence um, lived in by someone who very jealously guards his privacy. So it's very difficult to find a modern photograph of it. I haven't actually been in, although several of my colleagues have. Is this is the extraordinary range that he built. Um, there's, a, there's a sort of gallery behind there with a whole series of rooms at the back, including this great hall, which was his luxurious um, dining room with uh, um, wall paintings and this beautiful, uh, magnificent uh, carved roof. It had its own private kitchen below and next door uh, was the, the, the abbot's own private bedroom with his own private lavatory. Now, it wasn't only the lives of the abbots that became much more comfortable the lives of many individual monks were tr transformed too. At Durham, uh, a new kitchen of great splendour and technical virtuosity was built. Here's a drawing of it. This was built um, in the 1370s to supply monks with roasted meats, which they could eat in a private, agreeable dining room called the loft, where each monk had his own silver cup. The austerity of communal life was relieved by a spectacular new dormitory at Durham that was built in 1398 to 1404. Obviously, when it was built, it didn't contain these huge Celtic crosses. It is now a museum um, and the cathedral library. But it did have, now removed, individual cubicles, each lit with its own low-level window. So the, the big windows are up there that light the space. You can see one of them there. But you can also see here a window. And each of these windows, many of them now hidden behind the bookshelves, lit a private cubicle in which the monks could um, sleep um, and live and read um, in privacy. Uh, even the seats in the rear daughter, their communal lavatories, were partitioned off to give privacy, which never would have happened a hundred years before. And in the new cloister, uh, the openings were glazed and the walks were furnished with individual panelled carols for the monks to study in. And if they should tire of all this luxury in Durham, they could go to their holiday home at Finkel, just uh, down the River Weir, a very pretty spot in the care of um, English heritage. Yes, of course it had a church, but all these buildings here were guest houses for the monks to rest in from the exhausting business of being in the main monastery um, at Durham. Uh, they went uh, in groups of four at a time uh, and they could go for country walks and rejuvenate themselves. So these changes... Um, and others were all accelerated by an improvement in economic conditions in the 1470s and actually by the 1520s um, almost all estates had seen a noticeable increase in income. I'm talking about the, the monastic estates now but I've talked about the secular ones earlier. And this boost led to a new wave of monastic construction. Most of it not directed to the liturgical needs uh, of the monastery, but simply directed to display. Towers were very popular, as were showy gatehouses, guest lodgings, um, and other sort of show-off, look-at-me additions. This is Abbot Marmaduke Hobie's uh, addition to Fountains Abbey, a colossal bell tower, 160 foot high, with statue niches in the massive corner buttresses. He wasn't the only one for other northern abbeys. At Shap, at Furness, similar huge towers were built. 
the tower at Bolton Abbey, which uh, was built in 1520, had a huge inscription on it celebrating the abbot who had built it. Um, here is St. Osith's Priory in Essex, where um, the abbot built this flashy new gatehouse, uh, faced with beautifully ornamented flushwork containing a beautifully carved niches. This was designed to be seen from the outside. If you go in through this uh, gatehouse and look back from the other side, it's totally plain on the other side. This was show-off architecture by the abbots to show off um, the wealth, the sophistication and the taste of the abbot. I want to move on now from these pretty breathtaking structures, which are at the crescendo, I think, of Gothic architecture in England to a much more mundane but no less important issue, and that is um, brick. The Romans, of course, had used brick extensively, and their buildings, as I described uh, in my very first lectures, were ruthlessly plundered for uh, their materials for a thousand years. But it wasn't until the 14th century when brick started to be manufactured again in England on any scale. At first, it was popular in counties where there was no building stone, like Norfolk. And in fact, uh, uh, my house in Norfolk has the um, earliest brick structure, structure in the county, which is a, 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 a 14th century undercroft. But it was also convenient in towns where a lot of building materials were needed. I've shown you this slide several times before, not today. This is um, the great parish church of Hull, which, as you can see, is built of brick. But in many cases, it was either, uh, brick was either mixed up with stone, um, uh, is here at Holy Trinity, or was rendered over, um, or was uh, um, covered up in some way. But um, during the 15th century, brick moved from being a material uh, which met special constructural needs to a material that was the material of choice for aesthetic reasons. Now, this was mainly due to improvements in manufacture that were introduced from northern Europe. And brickmakers, many of whom were um, Flemings or were Germans or Dutch, began to produce bricks of a uniform size and managed to do so in huge quantities very cheaply. They knew how to vary the colour um, and the hardness and how to make uh, moulded bricks um, as well. And it was uh, in this very important building that I showed you earlier that Henry V started to use uh, the brick. And you can see how he actually chose to use uh, brick for the chimneys and things here. And actually, a lot of the, this is rendered brick, actually. This was now being used as a material of choice. Of course, one of the great benefits of brick is you could make it anywhere that had good brick earth, um, ideally close to a building. And you could use lots of cheap labour to cut the earth out, to knead the clay, to mould it into bricks. And then all you needed to do is stack it up over a fire, which was called a clamp, um, and you could burn it. Here is uh, the uh, remains of a brick clamp excavated at a royal house called Enfield. But here in the, uh, is a photograph from the 1920s showing a brick clamp at a country house. Um, and you can see how at a castle like Kirby Muxlow Castle, uh, built in the 1480s, a brick clamp like this could build, could create 100,000 uh, bricks, not a particularly large number. So at first, the manufacturers, the people who knew how to build these brick clamps, came from the continent. And many of the bricklayers came from there too. But very, very soon, English bricklayers became very competent in doing this. And the earliest major brick buildings uh, are all associated with the court of Henry VI and with uh, Sheen Palace, which I showed you just now. Here is Hurstman Zoo Castle in Sussex, begun in 1441 by Henry's treasurer, uh, Sir Roger Fiennes. Um, now, the streams of design that these early brick buildings contain come together in Henry VI's great work of piety at Eton. Here is Eton College, one of the largest and most important religious foundations of the later Middle Ages. Established by Henry VI in 1440 to offer prayers for his dynasty and to provide education, incidentally, for 70 scholars. 
The vision was on a staggering scale. What you see today is only a fraction of what was intended. Uh, but what was new about this was the extensive use of brick. Uh, this was the first high prestigious building in England to be uh, constructed out of brick. Um, to uh, these uh, facades here have decorated brick patterns called diaperingon, which is uh, diagonal uh, uh, um, patterns of darker coloured bricks. And this building introduced a new sort of window. And you can see this window all over this building. This is a square-headed window with the lights in it without any cusping. Look, you see the just rectangular um, uh, divisions in these windows. This uh, uh, whole language here was creating the brick uh, language of Tudor architecture here in the uh, 1480s. Well, when Henry VIII came to the throne in 1509, the country over which he ruled was a fundamentally different one to that which his predecessors had known a century earlier. During the 15th century, the sense of Englishness that had been developing since the 13th century was consolidated. The shift in economic in, uh, influence from the aristocracy towards the merchants and the gentry created a self-conscious and assertive political community that was now represented in Parliament. The Peasants' Revolt, which happened in 1381, had ensured that this community wouldn't, as in France, for instance, make the common people entirely responsible for direct taxation, giving the upper classes fiscal immunity. That all classes in England shared the burden of taxation meant that English society was far less stratified and much more mobile than in most northern European countries. Englishmen now spoke a single language that was rapidly becoming the official language of administration and culture. The innovation of printing meant that from the 1480s, even relatively poor people could own a book printed in English and probably 30% of the population could read it. These people were independent, and determined, individualistic, and these were the people who were now building England. Architecture was no longer just for the abbot, the bishop, the prince and the aristocrat. It was for the merchant, it was for the gentry, it was for the farmers, it was for the artisan. This is just a shot of the medieval buildings in York, um, relatively humble ones, just to make the point that this is where the building was in the 15th century. While Rome had been the inspiration for building in England from 1410 to 1300, and God had been the inspiration after that, it was now the independently-minded Englishman represented, I think, best by Robin Hood. Of course, nobody knew it in 1509, but only 30 years later, the whole infrastructure of everyday life in England was to be blown away by the Reformation. This remarkable little island with a strong independent culture populated with buildings of originality and beauty with a flourishing religious life and a wealthy and influential middle class was to fundamentally change and so were its buildings buildings cut off from streams of thought on the mainland but this ladies and gentlemen is the story of my next lecture you will have to wait until October the 10th to hear it, though. In the meantime, I hope you have a great summer, and I really hope that you will take the opportunity to actually visit some of the amazing buildings that I've been talking about over the last four lectures. Thank you very much. Now, we do have the traditional seven minutes um, in which uh, I'd be very happy to uh, hear any comments or I'll answer any questions if anyone would like to uh, ask any. So, lady uh, just there, microphone coming to you. What was the precedent for the bay window? I mean, had, had, did it come from abroad or was it 
a completely new idea. Well, what was the precedent for the bay window? Um, was it a new idea? Did it come from abroad? Well, it's a really um, interesting question that's debated um, fiercely by um, architectural and art historians. And uh, this is really to do with the whole balance of what um, is, uh, if you like, invented in England during the 15th and 16th century and what is pinched mainly from Northern Europe, particularly from, from Burgundy. And I um, wrote a book in 1993 in which um, I uh, said that many of the features, including the bay window and other things, had been copied from the, uh, the Dukes of Burgundy um, from their um, palaces. I don't any longer believe that. Um, I actually think that that is not right, and I'm longing to rewrite the book, but I've got one or two other things on my plate at the moment. Um, what I think it developed out of was um, the existing, uh, out of a whole series of existing uh, m medieval uh, building patterns. In, in particular, um, the bay window of great halls, because uh, the great halls um, had, from quite early in the Middle Ages, these, these very big bay windows. And uh, they became architecturally more and more prominent. And I think. Uh, um, by the late 14th century, when the Great Hall was used less and people were using other rooms, they think, thought, well, we'd quite like a bay window in this room to give it status. And gradually, the bay window became uh, a hallmark, if you like, of rooms of status. And that's why that building at Nottingham is so important, because those rooms uh, with the bay windows are rooms of high status. So it started off as something as denoting rooms of importance. And I believe that it was a, um, actually a an invention that happened in this country? Sorry, rather a long answer to your question. Um, anything else I can help anyone with? There's a lady about eight rows back on the left. Um, you said, and I think it was the 15th century, they started using bricks. And they came from Flanders and Germany, was it? Did we have a lot of immigrants? Um, yes, um, absolutely, we did. I mean, the <coughs> there were huge, number, uh, huge numbers of immigrants. Um, before the Reformation, um, the building trades were rapidly div diversifying from the sort of 1480s onwards. Um, lots of people coming over. They were known as the, the Dutch, D-O-C-H-E. It doesn't mean they came from Holland. Do Dutch is a corruption of Deutsch. So they were n Northern Europeans. They were bringing uh, technologies, new technologies. They were bringing, I mean, for instance, there was no glass manufacture in England. Everything was imported. Every bit of glass for every single cathedral was all imported. It wasn't being made in this country. Um, and so people came with these skills and started to, to make them. And then, of course, after 1530 and after the Reformation, there was a deluge, particularly of Protestant refugees, who brought with them skills. And the diversification of the building trades in England was incredibly rapid, starting from the 1480s through the 1530s and into Elizabeth's reign, you have massive changes. And those changes are stimulated by immigration and they're stimulated by the absolute imperative, um, recognised by Henry VIII, by Elizabeth and by James I, that England had to start becoming self-sufficient in some of these things. And self-sufficiency in building materials manufacture was right at the top of the list. Bricks, glass, uh, uh, um, lime, all sorts of other things um, were, were, were being, and nails, um, obviously lots of military hardware, was all being made in this country on a large scale by the reign of James I, which it hadn't been in the reign of Edward IV. So immigration, utterly vital. There's a gentleman there. Is there a point where you can say that the definition of a tower gave way to the definition of a house? Oh, <laughs> well, people have written PhDs on this subject, um, <laughs> and people get very, very worked up about this um, particular um, uh, issue. Um, well, um, what certainly happens um, is that in uh, 1529 to 30, Henry VIII builds um, an utterly radical building. And that building is uh, Whitehall Palace, in which, for the first time, uh, the most intimate lodgings are not put in a tower. All his private lodgings are built on a single level in a single line. 
So really, from the, 15, from the building of Whitehall Palace in the 1530s, the desire to, to make the tower, in any sense, the sort of principal part of where you live, dies away. There are various little revivals later, and people build towers and buildings, but as a sort of big impetus, it disappears. So the question is, before that, you know, is there a sort of transition phase when the tower and the house you know, change? I think it's a, it becomes a semantic argument after a while, you know. Um, people love living in towers because um, of the, the sense of sort of power and superiority that you get from being higher than everybody else and going up, and they're expensive and complicated things to build. Um, when you stop building um, a, a tower, you start building other types of status symbol. So what I would say in answer to your question is, is we could have a long discussion about where one begins and one ends, but essentially, I think you can say that the big residential status symbol, more or less from the Saxons till the 1530s, is the tower. After the 1530s, it ceases to be so. How you categorise it, we could have a happy argument about. It's time for one last question, if there is one. It's a gentleman right on the far side um, at, at the back. If you build a tower or a castle, as we saw in the photographs, out of brick, is it defensible? Right, well, this is another, this is another wonderful, um, uh, great debate. So um, here is Hurstman Zoo Castle. <coughs> um, it's surrounded by a great big moat. It's got uh, machicolations, these things around here. It's got battlements. Uh, it's got gun loops. These are, these are gun loops. Uh, these are arrow uh, slits here. It's got a slot here for great big portcullis. Here we are again. Um, machicolations. Um, right, you can't see it on the side, but there are, there are gun loops. Uh, well, they've either got arrow slots at the top there, battlements. People have said... These, these are castles. These are designed for defence. But they miss an absolutely fundamental point, which is that uh, battlements, arrow loops, matriculations uh, are nothing to do with defence. They're to do with architectural style. They are, uh, just go into the 18th century for a moment and think of um, uh, a, a portico on the front of a country house. I mean, a portico comes from the, the you know, from the early Greek buildings where you had four great tree stumps, you know, holding up the, 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 the pediment of a building going back. That's not what they were doing. That was an element of style. So when you look at a building like this, they are building in the style of the age, which was a style which had military and chivalric con connotations. And people like Rafe Lord Cromwell, who built this, wanted to be seen um, uh, in, the, in a sort of military chivalric light and therefore he built his house in that sort of style. By this stage, you know, gunpowder cannons are invented. Someone fired a cannon at that, it would fall down in five seconds. <laughs> Nothing to do with that at all. So what happens, very importantly, what happens um, in the early 14th century, and even in the late 13th century, when people argue intensely about when the point happens, is that uh, this, the, the, the sort of castle... Uh, um, attributes, trappings, are purely stylistic um, and they're nothing to do with um, defence. So the answer to your question is, is no, these are not castles in the sort of sense where this is all about war and things. This is architectural style. Thank you much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.